So in the spirit of cross collaboration here at the Peace for Quality, we kicked off our our day today talking about cybersecurity, and now we're going to switch the conversation to talk a little bit about clinical diagnostics. So this has a clinical diagnostics initiative, um, but we realized too that there's lots of opportunities that we'd love to engage with some of our clinical diagnostics partners in the work we're doing in Peace for Quality. So Peter Shearstone is joining us online. He is part of MDIC's uh, clinical diagnostics steering committee. And I also want to uh, point out Ravi Navar here. Ravi is on the uh, case for quality steering committee, um, but comes from a diagnostic company. So he was one, uh, one of the people responsible for helping us to kind of bridge the discussion of how we can bring in more diagnostic companies into the conversation about quality. So Peter, I'll turn it over to you. I have just given you keyboard control, so you should be able to move your own slides. You may have to click it once to kind of initiate it and then click it again, and you should have it. No, oh, thanks, Stephanie. Can you all hear me all, all right? We can hear you great. Great, hey, that's fabulous. And yeah, I do have control, so um, I guess I could launch that missile now that I want to launch. Uh -huh. I don't have that much power. Oh. Um, so good morning, everybody. Uh, good to join you all over the phone. I'm actually calling you from Kansas City, Kansas, so um, hopefully it's a, a nice day there as it is as it is here. Um, you know, Stephanie uh, had asked me to kind of uh, provide a, a, a slide deck on the intersection of quality and, and IVDs, clinical diagnostics, and then also provide you with some information on what are some of the initiatives that we're working on. Uh, in the clinical diagnostics, uh, the CDX program within the MDIC framework. So, um, okay, did the screen flip on your side? Not yet. Not yet. No, but maybe a little bit. Okay. All right. Let's see. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. So, just as a matter of introduction, so. Um, I'm the head of global quality and regulatory for Thermo Fisher Scientific, and coming up on my one-year anniversary uh, next month. Um, I can't believe it's already been a year, but um, yeah, there it is. Um, 30 years in the healthcare industry, so I've, I've spent a, a fair amount of time in, in diagnostics devices uh, and pharma. Um, but but diagnostics has kind of always been home, if you will, from from my early days um, after I got out of sales. Funny enough. Uh, of biotech products. I got into uh, diagnostics for a company called uh, Corning Diagnostics in uh, Walpole, Massachusetts uh, back in the late 80s. Um, and, and have had stints at a number of the diagnostic companies uh, in the world and of course most recently Thermo Fisher which uh, we have about a, about a four, oh actually I should say, should say like an eight to, eight to nine billion dollar business um, in the diagnostic space whether it's um, let's say immunodiagnostics, clinical chemistry, drugs of abuse, or on the NGS uh, DNA side of, of the house. I am based out of Waltham, Mass, and um, as I said, I, I've been in sales and R&D tech support, so have made my way around uh, the functions, uh, you know, to today. Um, you know the um, the IVD industry, just as a background, you know, is expected to reach about you know over 80 billion dollars by 2022, and um, compounded annual growth rate of of nearly five percent uh, up to up to up in including 2022. So it's it's an industry that um, obviously has been in place for a very long time, um, and is essential to the overall clinical picture of patients when they're presented whether at a clinic or an ER, uh, hospital, wherever, I think you all have experienced in one way, shape, or form a diagnostic test. Um, IVDs, you know, are, are the technique in which medical devices and reagents, accessories are used to examine specimens. Um, so typically, for, for I guess for most folks, it's, uh, it's blood or it's, it's urine. Um, and again, those tests are used to detect diseases, conditions, uh, and infections. Uh, today, for example, I'm at our microbiology facility here in Kansas City, where we make uh, agar plates along with a number of reagents. So it's it, it's a very very large space where um, the results are critical to treatment. Um, these tests are performed everywhere, like I said, and there's over 40,000 different IVD products um, that uh, that uh, healthcare.
healthcare providers can provide and, and test for a huge range of conditions. Um, you know, you've got uh, organic chemistry, biochemistry for proteins and lipids, for example, molecular, as I mentioned. And then last point is, you know, studies have shown, uh, I think the most recent one I saw was 2016, is that, you know, IVD testing guides nearly 70% of clinical decisions, 70%, but yet is only two, just over 2% of the, uh, of the healthcare costs um, in the U.S. market. So, um, you know, the, rely the, the reliance on diagnostic tests is, is significant. And, um, you know, I could just give you an example. In, uh, in hematology, so blood testing, so when you go and get your white blood cells, your red blood cells tested, your, your complete blood counter, your CBC, there's 425 million CBCs run a year in the U.S. alone. Um, so just to give you some scope on how important uh, you know, some of these tests are. Um, oops, sorry about that. You know, again, it's a unique industry with unique challenges. Um, it's, you know, you com you're combining uh, instruments with software, um, reagents, calibration and control materials, accessories. It's, it's a very complex supply chain. Um, you know, your manufacturing and, and operations are often um, split. So, for example, as I mentioned, I'm here in Kansas City where a lot of the consumable materials are made. But the instruments are made, you know, in another in another factory uh, within the Thermo Fisher network. Um, so you've got you've got a lot of, of opportunity to to um, you know, manage quality systems for the same product at a distance. Um, of course, you all know that that you know LDTs are a big part of of the diagnostic space. But you know we um, file lots of. Uh, PMAs and 510Ks for a certain class of products with the FDA. We have the, uh, the in vitro uh, diagnostics regulation, the IVDR, in, in Europe coming on board here in a few years, uh, along with the MDR, which was just coming up here in uh, 20, uh, 2020. Uh, so we're under, uh, obviously, a lot of regulation. And again, that regulation is expanding. So we have seen uh, the NMPA in China, um, who are issuing, you know, guidance in this area almost weekly, uh, but other countries like um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Africa, Kenya, uh, Nigeria, Ghana, starting to um, really move more into the regulated space around IVDs. Uh, as an industry, you know, we, we had to, and for many of us, follow the MDSAP approach, you know, to sell in Canada, which obviously involved the notified bodies. Um, and the strength of that program and the, and the auditors that, that we've seen, I think like in any situation has, has varied. Um, and so what for me in, in my role, speaking for myself within, within Thermo Fisher, where I see the opportunity is the CFQ, VIP, and the MDAP um, as offering an interesting opportunity for IVD companies. And I guess I would ask the question, Stephanie, you know, I saw the graphic uh, presentation from a few weeks ago from, from Case for Quality. You know, how many IVD companies have engaged in that program? I, I, I have a guess, but I'd like to hear from you or from the group. I think Robbie and I have had the same discussion, and we think it's probably not many. Maybe it's just a couple, and I'm looking at Cisco here. I know Illumina has been. Two. Cisco's telling me two. Two. Okay. So, so um, grow that. Yeah, so how do we grow that, right? And I think I think the big, and I think this is in any, any industry, any part of the medical device diagnostic pharma industry, is that we have to absolutely get away from being a reactive business. I think we thrive on, um, maybe as human beings, we thrive on the excitement of problem solving and, and um, you know, getting, uh, you know, things people back off a of back order and, and kind of saving the day. But the reality of it is, is we've got to do a lot more proactive things to avoid the, the, the mistakes, the errors from happening in the first place. So um, having worked at a number of the of the industry members, um, I can tell you that that reactive mode, and maybe it's the same for many of you, is, is very common. And I, I look at this opportunity with the, the, uh, the VIP and the MDVAP as a way to move the, the, the thought, the, the thinking towards Towards proactivity and getting uh, out of the, let's say, the routine of of always um, 
know, going from, from, from crisis to crisis. And the benefits, I think, are pretty clear uh, from what I've, what I've seen in terms of you know, bringing more collaboration and more businesses to the program. Um, I know we are not part of the program, um, and, and I don't know who, who is, but uh, when you look at the, the number of companies that are involved in, in MDIC that are diagnostics, which I'll show you in a moment, um, it's, it's not small. And uh, I think we can we can do more there. I also wanted Stephanie to, to into the group to to, to give a, a a short endorsement of your working groups um, and how they relate directly to some of the challenges that we're seeing in the IBD space. Um, redesigning Kappa, you know, I'll tell you that that fundamentally um, we have uh, over 200 facilities, manufacturing facilities in our network. Um, nearly all of them have Kappa uh, as, a, as a part of their, obviously, a part of their quality system. We do have some sites that don't rise to the level of a quality system, very, very few, uh, less than five. But um, Kappa is, is fundamental to every one of those, those sites. So if there's a way to uh, make that a more streamlined, continuous improvement framework, then that's something that, that I'm, I'm very much interested in and would like to, to support. The same thing with your other areas, leadership engagement, I think, is key. Um, you know, I, fortunately, I, I have a very uh, engaged CEO and COO um, around, around quality, and I mean little Q quality uh, in the company, and also a big, big supporter of, of the function. So I also like to say that it's, it's not just the quality group, it's also the regulatory group. I think they, um, you know, need uh, to be seen as a strategic priority, a competitive and strategic advantage, quite frankly, uh, with support from the top. And then your last two, quality as a career, I can't emphasize. Uh, I've, I've tried in my, in my later part of my career here to put a lot of emphasis on this because without the, the young folks, uh, even knowing that we exist as businesses, um, we're, we're doomed. And I'll tell you that, that I've been to a number of universities uh, this past year, a number of high schools this past year doing career fairs on behalf of Thermo Fisher, and nobody knows who we are, and, and frankly, nobody knows who the industry is. So I think we need to make a big push to get folks to realize that the med tech industry is a very um, rewarding career opportunity. And then lastly, of course, uh, you know, any opportunity to, to create an industry safe space, I, I want to be supportive of. So I think Stephanie and to the group, this, the CFQ group, we can do a lot more uh, together. Um, the next slide is just a list of all the diagnostic companies that are uh, MDIC members. Um, and I'm sure like those couple of companies that you, you mentioned, Stephanie, are, are probably in the list here. Um, we got to do more to, to, to embrace that. And I think understanding the VIP program um, and helping to maybe dispel any kind of rumors or uh, and educate folks on the value that it brings, again, moving from, let's say, reactive to proactive, I think would appeal to many of these. It certainly appeals to me. And, um, you know, I want to be um, as supportive as I can. Again, as a, in an industry that, is, that has um, been very good to me, um, I think it's it's incumbent upon me and the other leaders in these companies to to embrace a different way of thinking. So um, pivoting a little bit to the clinical diagnostics program within MDIC, uh, just to share a few slides on this, and then I'll, I'll open it up for questions. You know, the goal of the of the program really is to foster innovation and speed and, and to speed uh, patient access to new tests. Um, by developing new tools and, and methods, uh, improving processes to assess safety effectiveness and the value prop of diagnostic tests. So that last point, of course, um, you know, very important as we as we innovate in the space. You know, what are those tests that are going to be very very important um, for 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 for, you know, for for people as they get older? Um, you know, we think about, for example, the recent um, concussion test that was that was cleared by the FDA. Uh, how important that is for a lot of the young folks playing sports. Um, you know, just a, a massive step forward in an area that that has got a, a you know a lot of um, costs associated from a healthcare point of view. Um, 
but you know, what are those tests that are going to come for al Alzheimer's and, and future cancer tests? So we see the, the, the program here is, is working on regulatory science to help advance uh, towards this goal. Um, we do have a number of projects underway. I'll speak about a few of them. Um, the, uh, you can see the, the kind of the graphic on the right there, the, the clinical evidence tools. So um, the surrogate sample framework, I'll discuss that. Essentially, you know, when you do your clinical study, you don't always have access to this, all the samples you need. So we, we're working on, a, on an opportunity there. Along with clinical evidence and real world evidence, um, on the uh, kind of the, the three o'clock or the six o'clock position there, and then lastly on the on the nine o'clock position is an area that has had you know a lot of um, uh, you know focus in the last few years around finger stick and the quality of finger stick samples as as uh, as uh, they're used to get the diagnostic information. Uh, we do have a, a program called Shield, which is around the systemic harmonization and interoperability. Uh, enhancer for lab data. Um, kudos to you if you can say that five times fast. Um, the, uh, that is in, in partnership with OIR, which is of course the uh, FDA's Office of the Future Diagnostics and Radiological Health. And then on the bottom left there is a new project which was launched just a year ago uh, on somatic reference samples, and I'll talk about that just in a moment. So in terms of surrogate samples, as I said, you know, it's very difficult getting, getting um, Clinical specimens. Um, we have to, we don't have a predictable path for using them. Uh, so the goal, of course, is to establish a, a foundational um, regulatory science construct for the use of them uh, to support product development in the regulatory process. Um, we've developed that framework in 22 months. It was released in 2017 and submitted to CLSI, which is the uh, which is the uh, governing body over over uh, clinical lab science. Um, We've harmonized the framework in January, and uh, about again over a year ago, it was accepted. CSI accepted the framework, and it was it's in the new version of EP39, which is a, essentially a standard that uh, exists and will be published uh, in October of next year. So, um, lots of good work here. You can see on the right side of the column. You know, we've had case studies developed for a number of of uh, of analytes. Total PSA, for example, is is prostate-specific antigen something very, very uh, important to uh, to, uh, to males uh, and, and prostate cancer detection? Um, and you can see, just again, rolling down the end of that, we've got a lot of work on on um, developing educational material, professional educational material to help uh, help folks, help companies um, in the industry. Um, secondly, is the real-world evidence here. So, how do we accelerate innovation for IVDs? Um, you know, we've got to explore barriers and, and innovative methodologies to use real-world data. Uh, that is to say, if, you know, if we have um, uh, objective evidence data from a, a clinic on a, on let's say, uh, let's say you uh, get clearance for your your claim uh, for for children for your assay uh, two and up, but you have nothing from 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 uh, birth to two. Um, we know that that some of the, the clinics, um, you know, do use uh, tests for um, you know patients in that that young age range. You know, can we gather that data and use that data to help um, expand claims, for example? For, uh, for example, and um, I know my previous company um, we did this to expand expand claims um, at that lower age range by doing just that gathering data from uh, hospitals and clinics. Um, and, and providing that you know, to the agency. Uh, status there is that was initiated just about two years ago. Um, lots of hard work. Um, the, uh, uh, we're kind of marching a little bit slowly. Uh, one of the things with, with, with the clinical uh, diagnostic program is uh, we have 120 volunteers, but uh, again, like, like Keys for Quality, I'm sure, you know, you, 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 the timeline, everyone's doing this in addition to their regular work. So it's, it has kind of slipped somewhat, but um, we should be getting on track here in, in the summer. Uh, clinical evidence, um, you know, the vision here is to create a, an evidence white paper that um, IVD companies can use to make decisions on, on how to uh, develop credible evidence of analytical and clinical validity, as well as clinical utility, which is, of course, in support of, of the IVDR, and of course, 
the, you know, the FDA's and, and other regulators' requirements, um, which also will help with payer coverage, so reimbursement activities. Here, again, this was initiated you know, almost four years ago, um, and again, moving, moving towards uh, uh, a re release of the framework here um, towards uh, the, the back half of, of 2019. Fingerstick, as I mentioned, you know, Fingerstick, um, you may recall that company that shall not be named that you know, claims to be able to uh, perform, you know, massive amounts of, of, of uh, IVD testing on a, on a Fingerstick. Um, the real need, I think, you know, not only from that, but for some time has been how do we ensure Fingerstick quality, Fingerstick sample quality. Um, so we want to develop clear and uh, uh, analytical validity study designs for point of care devices, uh, not only the, the quantitative uh, but also the qualitative devices that use capillary blood specimens. Um, the work there is um, again, it's, in fact, this one actually is proceeding quite quickly. Uh, I believe we actually have um, uh, comments routing on our on our newest versions. And we're working on the release timeline. So again, good progress here. Um, there are, there is another area as I mentioned, the somatic reference samples, and this is really helping out um, to have efficient NGS uh, test development and validation, um, which will hopefully, uh, in, you know, streamline and um, uh, the steps necessary for for IBD companies uh, and for targeted therapeutic developers. So this really is all about um, uh, these, 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 these somatic reference samples uh, in terms of a, a prioritized set of samples. So publishing that as phase one and variants of those samples. So this is you know, very specific um, samples that are used to do clinical studies. Um, the, the opportunity here is to, is to contract with an outside firm to make these samples. So this is you know, kind of getting in the business of, of creating samples. Um, the, uh, the plan, again, phase one is kind of set the expectations and the criteria and the characterization. And then phase two is, again, the, the, uh, the, phase, the, the outsourcing or the transfer of those outputs to commercial entities, um, which may take one to one and a half years. Um, this has a multiple stakeholder approach. So again, within the within the clinical diagnostic program, you've got lots of folks that are interested in this. Um, not only our colleagues at the at the agency, but and of course our industry. But you can see there, you know, academic medical centers, the payers, uh, biorepositories, and of course the professional societies that exist today, like CLSI, for example. Um, these are just some of the elements of that that project uh, in support of it. So understanding the landscape. Defining samples, so you know what are they uh, supposed to uh, you know, be physically? Um, you know, characterizing the samples. How do we maintain supply of the samples? And again, the goal here for this would be these would be available to to anyone that needs them. Um, and again, you can see the rest there: variant prioritization, data quality, data integration, and creating a business plan. So again, how do we um, you know set this up for success? Uh, these are all being worked on. Uh, underneath the clinical diagnostic uh, program. And then lastly is the SHIELD uh, program that I mentioned. Um, there are, and, and the reason for this is, is there are limitations on interoperability uh, because of the different lab management and software vendors connecting to the hospital electronic health records. So you've got you know, instruments that are generating data uh, interfacing with the lab information management system connected to the hospital's HR. So how do we um, set up uh, ordinal value sets um, for tests and, and discrete units for quantitative tests so that we can we can ensure that the, the data transfer and the data information is is um, is valid and, and usable. Um, so the goal of course is to collaborate here uh, to advance patient care. Um, it should, if, if successful, expedite the uh, the research and, and, and practice of healthcare um, and by unifying IBD data um, and helping, of course, support the, the growing uh, expansion of, of electronic health records to make sure that uh, they're improved and protect public health. Um, 
there is not, I don't have anything specific on that in terms of progress, but it is something that we're looking into. So just to, just to wrap up my last slide here is in terms of next steps, um, you know, we, uh, I know Ravi uh, is in the room with you. Ravi and I have been talking for some time about, you know, how do we uh, move from a clinical diagnostics program to a more focused group, uh, subgroup within within MDIC focused on IVDs, again, manned by many of those companies I showed you earlier, to tackle the unique IVD topics that exist for this part of the industry. Um, I think, again, that the case for quality um, and, and the programs, the VIP and, and uh, program you've created, we've absolutely got to explore further opportunities to get after that proactivity that I've talked about. And lastly, you know, I think simply put, uh, much like Case for Quality and the other initiatives at MDIC, we have to execute. So, um, you know, working with, with, with Pamela Goldberg and, and I think the, the steering committee and Clinical DX is we've got to make sure that, that uh, all those projects I just mentioned are, are brought over the finish line, you know, successfully. Also, you know, that IBD focus group uh, above there, um, you know, really needs to be driving the, the, pro the project input. Um, into uh, into MDIC, so we absolutely have to um, produce and and get after the regulatory science areas that are most important to us. So um, that's my slides. I guess I'll pause there and and look for any comments or, or questions. So thanks very much. Thanks, Peter. Do we have any questions in the room? Touted the um, you know importance of uh, CFP, VIP, and all the benefits. Yet I think you said your company isn't involved when discovering why. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know you're all applauding and laughing, but I could hardly hear the question. <laughs> oh, uh, sorry, I'll, 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 I'll go ahead and repeat that. Um, audience members noted that you you mentioned the VIP program and how great you thought it was but that your company's not involved in it um, why are you not involved I, I think that having been there a year now I think the the issue as I said is it's a matter of education so you know for me uh, with such a huge network um, I really need to sit with with the principles behind VIP and and get a, a complete understanding of what it's going to take so uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to that conversation, Stephanie. So if there's somebody there in the room that I can reach out to. We're happy to do that. Joseph Piente, he's got his, his hand up. He's ready to give you a call after the meeting. So, so let's, let's get together. Yeah, let's get together and talk because I, I know, again, uh, you know, part of my challenge is, again, moving my company uh, towards proactivity. And if this can help do that, then um, I'd be hypocritical if I didn't embrace it. So. Thank and, you. And, and to that point, though, I, I want to point out, and I think a lot of you can testify to this, that a lot of the success of the VIP has been in that peer-to-peer -peer contact. I know we've had a lot of companies here in this room who would have talked to their peers in other companies and said, hey, you need to get involved in this. So um, I, that, is, that is not an unreasonable thing. And I'm sure, um, Peter, you'll have a couple of folks reaching out to you after this meeting to, uh, to tell you about um, directly about their experiences. Yeah, no, I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Other questions, comments? All right. Oh, well, I'll just uh, <laughs> Peter, thank you for this presentation. And it's Pamela Goldberg. And I Hi, think Pamela. It, uh, it, it's really exciting to see the progress that the, the diagnostics initiative has pursued and the fact that some of those uh, projects that you mentioned today have uh, come to fruition and are being completed and I look forward to uh, what comes next for this group and, and where we're headed with diagnostics and uh, for those of you who are in the room we have far more uh, diagnostic companies as part of MBIC. So to get those companies to embrace the work that this group does in terms of quality, um, including Thermo Fisher, we look forward to the future of that. So thank you. Uh, you're welcome, Pamela. And thank, and thank you. And, and thanks to Carolyn and all the volunteers from all the companies. Um, 
it's a real pleasure to work with everyone. Uh, I, I, I think you rarely see in your career such, such amazing levels of collaboration between between companies, the, the MDIC, and, and the agency. Um, it's, it's refreshing, actually. So uh, thanks for your support, too, Pamela. All right. Well, thank you. All right. So I'll look forward to getting a phone call, email, text message from the VIP. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Have a good day, all. Thank you, Peter.